Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar entitled Proactive Peer Support, Protecting and Promoting the Well-Being of First Responders. I'm Samuel Bro, Program Manager in Prevention and Promotion with the Mental Health Commission of Canada. It's a real pleasure to be hosting this webinar with you today. Before we get started, I did want to go through a few housekeeping items. First, note that audio is provided in broadcast mode through your computer speakers. You can hear us, but we cannot hear you. And that's a good thing, given that we are over 100 participants in today's presentation. Second, this webinar is also being recorded, and it will be posted on the Mental Health Commission's website under the Webinar Archives sections following the presentation in a few weeks' time. And third, if you'd like a copy of today's slide deck and other resources mentioned in today's webinar, you can actually download it right now using the Files pod located in the center right of your screen. You can select the item you wish to download and click Download File. Fourth, I invite you to send any questions using the Q&A pod, which can be found on the bottom right of your screen. Questions posted in this pod will go directly to the host, myself and my colleague Hannah. We will hold most questions during the presentation until the end, during which we'll address any questions during a question and answer period. And finally, if you'd like to interact with other webinar attendees and or post comments, please continue to do so in the chat pod. As my colleague Hannah has prompted, we already see some great discussions. A kind reminder that the comments made in the public chat box will be shown to everyone and will be shown with your name. And so please ensure that it is appropriate according to your wishes. With that, I would like to introduce you to our guest speaker today, John Anderson, who is Superintendent Supervisor with the Peer Support and PTSD Prevention, Paramedic and Senior Services at the Regional Municipality of York. John started his career as a paramedic in 1980, and in 85, his interest in cumulative stress in paramedics led him to a member of the York CISM Team Steering Committee and founding member of the York Tri Services CISM Team. That is, he became a member and then founded the York Tri Services CISM Team. John's interest in peer support also led him to an opportunity in 2015 to research and develop a peer support team for York Region Paramedic Services. Modeled on peer, proactive, uh, on peer support provided in Queensland ambulances services in Australia, the focus of this model is really on being proactive instead of reactive, providing information, support, and building relationships before an incident occurs. And so partnering with Tema Contra Memorial Trust was a key component in providing training to the original 21 members, and in only two years, the team has grown to 36 members. John is also currently a member of CSA's Paramedic Psychological Health and Safety Standards Committee, a trainer with the commission, and has recently accepted as a comment with York Region Paramedic Services as the Superintendent Supervisor of Peer Support and PTSD Prevention. In his newest role, John focuses on coordinating the peer support team, developing a team of senior services and long-term care staff, introducing prevention and resilience training during new staff orientation, stay-at-work programs, and return-to-practice programs following both physical and non-physical injuries. And I, must, I did want to highlight um, the timeliness of this presentation, given uh, the recent events in Toronto and our thoughts and certainly our um, thoughts are with uh, first responders that are actively uh, responding on the scene, and, and John and I were uh, both uh, of the mind that this presentation might be timely given uh, the topic. And so with that, I pass it over to you, John, to begin your presentation. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks, Samuel, for the uh, lengthy uh, introduction. Um, it actually saves some time because now that takes away my first page. So, and I was really happy to see you uh, stumbling a little bit with that because it means that it's okay for me to stumble because you're the pro and I'm. This is my first. So, um, I'd like to start off by thanking the Mental Health Commission of Canada for inviting me to present on York Region Paramedic Services Peer Support Team. Um, we came up with the fancy title that you see on your screens, but in actual fact, this presentation will be more like our team, our story. I hope this will be a quick presentation so that hopefully it generates some outside-the-box thinking that will work for the organization you work for or 
to generate some questions and discussion points for later on. Uh, please keep one thing in mind. It is important that you start thinking outside of the box, but also be greedy. This is a great opportunity for you to be greedy and keep thinking, what will work for me? What will work for my service? Our team model was built more from the ground up with management support than as a direction from the top down. Keep that in mind also. It's a grassroots type organization. One last thing before I start, I'd like to ask everyone to just take a brief moment in silence to think about the incidents in the news recently, the tragedies out west, the recent local incidents that we're dealing with, and think about those that lost their lives and were injured, and for those that were present just doing their jobs. Thank you for that. So who is York Region Paramedic Services? Well, January 1st, 2000, nine smaller municipalities were brought together into one service creating York Region Paramedic Services. At that point, all that was known for sure is we had a new boss. The rest was going to be our story. We've grown and currently we have approximately 580 employees, 64 ambulances, 22 response units, 13 support units, which include a peer support team RRU, which I'll talk about briefly later, uh, special response units, uh, multiple multi-patient units, and logistics vehicles. We have 22 stations and are growing. In 2017, our stats, we responded to 80,000 requests and transported 60,000 patients. We service approximately 1.2 million residents in New York region and we are an urban-rural mix, approximately 1,776 square kilometers, north section of GTA, and like the old ads used to say, you know, the region above Toronto. So in the beginning, uh, we had in place a very active and functional multi-service SISM team. It was made up of police, paramedics, firefighters, emergency nurses, mental health professionals. It was a very active team, very strong, very good in support. We had a very strong functional joint occupational health and safety committee, and this was very important for support for our team, and their presence and their activity level in our service indicated true concern for employees' health and safety. At the time, it really, it really wasn't well known how health and safety would include mental health, and that's becoming our future. We also, in paramedic services, our management, uh, from the supervisor level up, we're all trained in psychological first aid. Um, York Region was an early adopter of the psychological workplace safety standard, which provided us with lots of checklists and good, well-meant plans. We still needed to make it a living document, needed to embody the standard. Our regional and senior management support was exceptional. Paramedical, sorry, paramedical services management, very supportive. One, for any help they could get dealing with the trauma and the touchy-feely emotional stuff that a lot of people shy away from. And two, they had a true desire to help the staff. There was also a strong drive that they plain and simply did not want to see or experience any more hurt. As regional employees, I found our regional support staff very supportive, but initially they didn't know about what. I was invited to a meeting one day and I checked who else was invited and became quite concerned. Our human resources manager and a second human resources rep, regional joint occupational health and safety committee coordinator, our employee health unit rep, a regional well-being coordinator, and the kicker, a labor relations rep. Immediately my thoughts were, oh, oh, barely got started and I've screwed something up good. Where would I like to work next? The meeting where I was simply hoping to keep my job, I just tried to answer the question of what I was up to. This turned into one of the biggest shows of support for the peer support team that I could have imagined. The reps present pretty much offered me whatever I wanted and in many ways that still continues. Once you get that support, you will really have minimal worries and the support continues to build. 
in our service, what I was seeing, what we were seeing, was an increase in the occupational stress injuries. We saw them occurring, weren't sure how to help, and not all were being reported due to stigma, fear, and several other common barriers that we found. I was seeing a busier service where we were actually building in some of the problems, like less socialization time, more single car stations. We had a program called the part and chart. Basically, keep moving, get your paperwork done quicker, get to the next call. So there was less interaction between crews at the hospital. Due to the urgency to clear and get back to bases, there seemed to be less informal diffusings as after calls, less natural peer support. Partners working together didn't really know each other. There is a lot of new staff. There was the stigma and self-stigma. I'm tough. I can handle this. I don't need help. Everyone else survived. I'll survive. There was an unfortunate lack of knowledge, not knowing what to do, where to go, why I feel like this, why I don't feel anything. We were also noticing an increase in identified suicide and suicide attempts in first responders. As a service, we didn't want to get on any of these lists. My role as an operations supervisor at the time, I had a desire, I had a need, it's just the way I am to address the situation, to fix the situation. I was in my deputy chief's office and we were wrapping up my uh, performance appraisal and thankfully, alphabetically, I was the first in his office. I checked out a document on the wall and was re realized I was reading the strategic plan for the year and he asked me what I was interested in, what would I like to take on or what task would I like. Um, unfortunately, I misread the first line about peer support and I said, hey, I'll take that one. Best reading error I ever made. So I started to review what was out there. I found it quite confusing due to all the different forms of peer support. The Mental Health Commission of Canada lists seven types of peer support available. If you haven't yet, check out the Mental Health Commission of Canada's document on the website, Guidelines for the Practice and Training of Peer Support. While driving around on night shifts, I kept thinking, what do we need in York? We the medics. I was trying to figure out what was truly needed, and at the same time, I was more than willing to be a little bit greedy on this one. There were restrictions that I put on the project myself because I knew that if I could have minimal Im impact on operations, minimal impact on the budget, I figured if we could do this with very little negative impact and a positive outcome, there would be a lot less chance of anyone saying no and stopping the process. I had several discussions at about this time with uh, Vince Savoya from Timber Concert Memorial Trust. They were not all pleasant. I can be a little bit stubborn. I don't have any background in mental health. Um, I was just really a good people watcher and a good advocate for my staff. With Vince, at times it may have been a heated discussion. I had a, a bad habit of asking why or a lot of questions in general, and he was very patient with me. I didn't like some items that he was offering or saying to me, and I, actually I didn't want it. I didn't even want it mentioned. I wanted costs, which for me included any deals I could get, because again, I was being greedy, but I'm also kind of cheap. I needed time frames to get things up and running. With this information and the other information that I gathered, I presented to the paramedic senior management because I needed to get their buy-in and support. I needed to demonstrate that I was someone with a drive to get this done. I needed permission to spend some of their money. I received, received approval to select the team or set, select and train a team. So I started a small campaign to introduce the peer support team concept to staff. Started off as a series of emails and personal conversations with as many staff, with as many of my peers as I possibly could. We had to sit down and figure out how the, the deployment of the team members would eventually work out. Remember, I had my goals, but I wanted to ensure flexibility. I needed a trial, but not a trial with an end date. I had to work the, out the logistics of this remembering my self-imposed restrictions of no impact on operations and a minimal cost. How were we going to introduce the team members? How were we possibly going to roll this out? 
we tried to consider all of that ahead of time. Here is one area that if I was to do it all over again, I would strongly consider forming a peer support action committee or advisory committee. Someone to help, someone to provide some support. My support came from several of my peers, some exceptionally encouraging, and that was great support. But a lot of support came from the naysayers, people that said, nah, this isn't for us. And they were actually greater support as I needed them to prove them wrong. We started off with the selection process, and as mentioned, the concept of the team was announced service-wide. Again, a series of emails went out, messages, conversations were held, um, how the nomination process was going to work. Um, it, we t went, entered into a third-party confidential nomination process. The emphasis was on someone you trust and would maintain a confidence with, someone you, yourself, would go speak to in a time of need. That's who you could nominate. The only other part of the selection process that I had to make sure we could maintain was in order to have a minimal impact on operations, I had to make sure that team members, once nominated, were evenly distributed over all the platoons. The screening of staff was all done third party. An initial phone call to accept the nomination, and it actually turned into a quick wellness check. The assessment survey was completed and reviewed by a psychologist. Uh, there was a personal psychological type of interview held by uh, a third party. The goal of all of this, these measures was to ensure the nominees were in a healthy place to take on the added responsibilities without causing harm to themselves. Finalization, finalization of the team members occurred uh, and training started. Uh, the training started with quick team meetings following, and we discussed expectations and what was going to happen. One thing that's important again here is none of the team members' names were actually announced until the training was complete. This was done to ensure privacy in the event that there was a need for that person, that nominated peer, t or, uh, nominated peer support team member to step out of the process and they weren't able to continue. So it was felt that it would be better not to announce until everybody was trained and willing to continue. Our training uh, was the first area that Vince and I had to work out. I'm not exactly sure how the program is delivered in other areas, but doing it in the manner that we did allowed for growth of the team members, a, a very strong bond between all the team members. Uh, it also gave them an opportunity to do the training, not be overloaded, and experience using the new information before a second part of training started. What we decided on was to do was provide one course at a time, allow the team to use the info, and about a month later come in for the next training. This served to be invaluable. It also built some very strong bonds amongst the team members, as I mentioned. It gave the team members a support network that we were not expecting to, to occur as strong as it did, or that we would all desperately need this in the first few months. So our training was psychological first aid, the manners model, uh, how to deal with critical incidents. It was a two-day training program. A month later, we got together for applied suicide intervention skills training, ASSIST. And the key about this is it's not just about suicide intervention. It is one of the key and best programs that I've ever taken in regards to helping you deal with communication specific to suicide intervention, but just communication in general. Again, that was a two-day course. A month later, we got together again as a team, and we did the mental health first aid. For us as paramedics, it was a, a very good review and refresher and a good wrap-up to the other training days. Again, that's a two-day program. About a month later, um, we were able to get in on a resilience building workshop for a day, and uh, that has expanded now to, uh, and our team has actually just taken module one of a four-part Reach for Resiliency program uh, with Wendy Lund. Now, one of the areas that uh, Temaconta provides information on and, help, and is willing to help with is policy building. One of the areas that all my managers and senior management want 
is policies and therefore policy building. Anyone that knows me or has seen me present on this topic may recall this slide. And I like to follow it by this slide. Uh, if you haven't guessed, I'm not a fan of policies. When we were new, we had no idea what policies were needed. We needed to see what we were going to encounter. We needed to have some freedom to be flexible with the situations that we encountered. Myself, the team members, through trial and error, came up with some guidelines that fit into our operations in our service. We refined some of my ideas and thoughts, used the programs to help develop some guidelines that we could work with and fall back on as and when needed. We had our flexibility to allow for an individualized approach to peer support. What I kept finding when reviewing other policies, that they were written about how to discipline or dismiss the peer support team member from the team. My approach was not, was no one gets off the team unless they are healthy. I can't monitor them if they don't report to me. Being on the team means they deal with me, we work things out together, I made a promise that I had their backs, and I kept it. That built-in trust in me by the team demonstrated how to build trust between their peers. Our next steps was a team introduction to the service. An, an email went out to all the service with a list of the names. The names were also posted with some brochures in every station. Um, and basically what it was was a very soft rollout. The team was given a month working on their own operational vehicles. Um, to build bonds, to, to establish some bonds with staff. They were told, go ahead and assist with any question you want. If somebody came and asked you about a boot allowance, cleaning a vehicle, offering a hand to help out, go ahead and do it. Offer them coffee, tea, water. I gave some uh, TIM cards out so that they would have some extra money so they didn't have to spend their own. But team members were spending their own money to develop a bond or a hook with their peers. They started the conversation. It didn't matter what the issue was. It wasn't confined to a critical incident. We were just trying to build those bonds, those hooks with all the staff. The staff, my team listened. They were present. They were not intrusive. They educated the, educated the peers at every opportunity. The next month, uh, they were in peers and to try and initiate coverage. I made a request to use a rapid response unit for a month to improve mobility and was quite happy when that turned into, hey, do you want to keep the RRU for the program? See how it works out. Like I said earlier, I'm cheap. If I'm offered anything, I'll take and figure out how to use it later. The team goals were still the same, build relationships. Peer support team members didn't need to attend to the scenes of calls. They needed to be present afterwards at the hospital, at the station at the breakfast meeting to provide the support. In the final stage, we kept the RRU. It's a tool in our program. It's not our program. Staff are available on all platoons on all shifts. The RRU allows some flexibility on day shifts to get around and to do more or see more people. But the peer support team members work side by side with medics. We have only had a strictly admin person just recently with myself and all of us prior to that were operational. We asked the platoon leadership to be flexible if a peer support team member was requested by a medic, and this took some time to get that message across, but now it is a standard part of our process that, that's followed frequently. Continuing education for the service, um, every opportunity we had, uh, continuing, education, continuing medical education, professional development days, we asked for 5, 10, 15, 20-minute presentation, whatever you could. For the continuing education for the team, we looked for any workshops were available, any webinars, symposiums. We looked at other agencies like police. They have a very strong uh, support unit. Um, the Badger Life Canada, Mood Disorders of Canada. Uh, we have a South Lake Regional Health Centre in Newmark that frequently offered mental health workshops and seminars that we could send people to. An excellent resource on dealing with uh, grief is funeral homes and funeral home directors. Get somebody like that to come in and speak with your group. 
I'm, I'm going to strongly suggest you look around. It doesn't have to be first responder oriented. See what others are doing and try to adapt it to your needs. Again, stepping outside of the box, looking to see what you need for your service. So our finding and observations. Um, initially, like most new plans, there was some uh, hesitation and doubtful if they would ever use the peer support. We had a lot of comments like, yeah, I'll never use it. Um, we had a, to, to build the trust, we had a very clear confidentiality statement that we made sure was clear and available to everybody. And basically, it was, uh, confidentiality was maintained and couldn't be broken unless there were permission was given by the individual to share any info. There was harm to themselves or others. Uh, a child has been or may be abused or neglected. An elderly or disabled person has been or may be abused or neglected physically, mentally, or financially. And in York Region, we have a very strong workplace violence or workplace harassment policy where we had been strongly uh, advised that if that was violated or breached in any way, uh, the peer support team member would have to break that confidence, but it would be done with a specific rep in the human relations department. The relationships that were building, being built were built on trust, and we had to prove that the team was trustworthy. We started to notice, uh, sorry, we started to notice senior medics were approaching team members. And this could be something as simple as just, hey, uh, I'm anxious about retiring, I wasn't expecting this, can you give me any support? We noticed that we started to build that trust that was so much needed. There was an acceptance phase. Staff started calling the phone lines. We had set up a confidential phone line and a confidential email, so we were starting to get phone calls on that line. We started to receive the emails. Staff were now reaching out to peer support for assistance. They were looking for the peer support member that was on duty. Um, several of them, once the contact, initial contact was made, that contact was being maintained. We moved into a, a referral phase, and I overheard this conversation uh, at a station that I was working in one night, and the people didn't realize that I was in the supervisor's office, and it was a conversation between two fairly young medics, and the conversation went, hmm, that's interesting. You should speak to someone from peer support. Speak with John. Um, and then we also got referrals in a way that uh, peers were starting to look after their peers and we would get messages like, could you check in on so-and-so? I'm concerned about them. In our service, we also had a bit of a perfect storm going on and it was all coming together at the same time. Our management team was being trained in just culture or collaborative change. We were uh, all being trained in road to mental readiness. Um, which gave a very good base for a common language to use regarding uh, peer support and mental health over all the service. Supervisory staff received leadership training and all of our employees received the basic training. We started to collect the stats as I've been a paramedic for a long time. I know we've got to be proving stuff all the time. So I was collecting the stats. They were being used, needed, whatever I could get the stats to prove. Uh, they were collected from day one. Uh, I tried to find some information about how to collect the stats, but we decided to go with there's no identif identifiers of the person being contacted. And to be honest, we really weren't sure what to collect. This is an example of uh, the, the initial form that we used, a very simple form. And uh, it was uh, basically a fill in the blank, and it was the information that we thought it thought we needed at the time. Uh, it was emailed into a general email account uh, and then with some help with a few of their data people in the region, they converted it into stats for me. We have now moved to a, a mobile app that's uh, on your phone and um, what is really liked about it is every peer support team member completes a report at the end of every shift they work. doesn't matter whether it's a night shift, day shift, shift on the RRU, whatever, they complete a report. What they like about it is the report takes less than five minutes to complete. 
and it gives a picture of what they did as far as peer support for the day. So we wanted to look at the stats, and um, I was able to compare the stats to what the York Critical Incident Stress Management team had been doing for paramedic services for the year. And I was also able to find a service, uh, a very similar size service, with a traditional reactive peer support team. And we were able to compare those stats. So here are the stats, and uh, if basically to explain them, uh, they're from 2016, the first service being a reactive service and the second service being our service. And as you can see, they, uh, we both had a pretty close to 650 employees. One, the reactive service had 27 team members. They had a, a deputy chief, commander, clinical director, and the PST coordinator. Our service had 21 peer support team members, which included the coordinator, and I had uh, some oversight by a DC who just wanted to know when I was spending his money. The time frame, now these are the time frames that the stats were given to me for. So the one service, it was over a 20-month period, and in brackets I've adjusted it to uh, a 12-month period for both services. So as we look at the stats for employee contacts, and please, this is not anything to say that one is better than the other. It's just as a comparator. But the employee contra contacts for the reactive servers was 322 for the 21-month period, but 184 for the 12-month period. Follow-up contacts were 37 for a 12-month period. And work-related, they were all work-related because this was a reactive-type response, so it was a 184. Now, your slide is going to jump just a bit because I wanted to show our SISM team stats. And as you can see, we're very similar. So for the same 12-month period, um, our employee contacts for our York SISM team was 227. And this is just for paramedic services. Follow-up contacts were 48. And work-related, again, because it's a, a reactive uh, process, was 227. So in with our stats and with our uh, proactive peer support team, where we're out there, we're out there trying to talk to people, we're out there trying to see people, um, our stats are coming in a little bit differently, and I hope they give you a little bit of a jolt. So our employee contacts for a 12-month period would have been about 9,341. So what was considered a contact was any time that you spoke with a person and um, discussed any type of an issue that was bothering them or you assisted them in any way. So that's why the numbers were so high. Um, it, it's also part of that 9,000 is to establish the bond. The follow-up contacts were approximately 974, and those were all specific. Now, it seems like quite a low number when you consider the 9,000 number, but they were specific follow-up to an event. Okay? The f other follow-ups were done with employees would have been counted in the employee contacts. Now, the interesting item that's uh, shown here is that work-related we did separate work-related and home life uh, concerns, and 4,479, or actually, sorry, 4,886, 4, or 52% of the items were work-related, which means 48% were non-work-related. So we were working on the holistic type approach to this. We wanted to deal with the whole person. You can't separate what's going on at home from what's going on at work, and vice versa. So we wanted to look at the whole thing. If something wasn't working well at home, we had people that our, our team members or the staff could speak to. Um, I'll move on to our future, and uh, it arrived really quickly. We were not expecting the success we were receiving and the amount of attention that it was gathering. We just were not ready for it. Um, we were being contacted frequently by newspapers, magazines, people wanting to speak with us, people wanting our uh, plan, our, our process and all that, and we were still building it. Um, we utilized our regional communication staff for help. Uh, without them, it would have easily been overwhelming. And again, at the same time, we had the Center for Addiction and Mental Health needs assessment was going on in our service. 
uh, peer support team members initially weren't going to be part of the assessment, but it was found out that everybody kept referring to the work that the peer support team was doing. So uh, um, on the fly decision was made that we would be interviewed. Some of the results that were found were there was a need for team growth and CAMH at that time suggested that 10 to 15 percent of your overall service number should be peer support. They also discussed wellness checks, which would be a individual wellness check just to see how the individual is doing, how they're coping, making sure they're fine. It wouldn't be a, tr uh, a treatment plan or anything. It would just be something uh, to make sure they were doing well. There were suggestions for continuing education to both the service about what peer support is and to continue with team members for their education. Um, we were also having a, a strong desire to branch out to help our peers wherever we could. At the time, initially, we wanted to help out with ill and injured workers and their return to practice. We provided peer support for staff from neighboring services. We just couldn't say no, and we wouldn't say no. We spread into other departments and paramedic services. We spread into other areas of the region. Many of you may have heard about mental health injuries. They can happen anywhere, anytime, to anyone. And that was what we wanted to demonstrate with our peer support. Anywhere, anytime, anyone. Very quickly, a natural connection was occurring with peer support team members and various members of the service. Our fleet, logistics, scheduling, professional practice, admin, senior management, all wanted to have chats with peer support team members. Now remember, a peer is someone who is a commonality with another. In our case, it was acceptable. We all work for paramedic services. We all breathe there. Good enough. We're peers. I've had many challenges that there is no peer support available for departments other than operations and paramedic services. One of the interesting challenges I had was with a department lead in front of their staff. They were quite heated that I was not providing any form of peer support to their staff in the room. And I took it all in. I listened carefully. Uh, at the same time, my phone started buzzing and beeping and ringing, making a lot of noise. I excused myself from the conversation but said to the team lead, the peer support team is growing. We are trying to change the coverage and makeup of our team. We are new, and we, are, we weren't expecting the demands that we were getting. After I left the room, I checked my phone, and I had received messages from four out of the six staff that were in the room. One simply said, thank you. One was, tell them the F off. One was, don't worry, your support got me through this. What do you need? The attitude of the department lead and the message I received from their staff proved our program worked and we were able to maintain the all-important confidentiality aspect at all times. The trust built at that encounter remains. The team lead still very loudly and clearly stated that they have no need of peer support, would never use it. And uh, surprisingly, this happens when we meet up for a coffee and a chat. Or they ask my opinion on how they should proceed with a difficult situation or when I provide information and contacts that should be used to help with a sick relative, um, peer support doesn't always have to come with a flashing neon sign. I spoke earlier of our management support. Other than encouraging an idea I had, a thought basically, I was provided with a very simple quote from our chief and general manager, Norm Barrett. The key here, Chief Barrett means it. When I have informed him that a neighboring services paramedic has asked for assistance, whether it's an allied service, a neighboring province, whatever it is, he gives us permission. We have a relatively new member to our senior management team, and I quickly learned that his quotes are a little longer. A key element to the successful management of contemporary paramedic services is a comprehensive staff wellness strategy inclusive of a robust and appropriately resourced peer support program with strong linkages and guidance with mental health practitioners. Uh, Samuel mentioned earlier that our, uh, the overall uh, peer support team is modeled after uh, a model in Queensland, Australia. And our division chief or director, David Eels, came from that service. So he's very well versed in peer support. Uh, we've moved on and we now have a well-being unit in our service and peer support is part of that. We offer the service to operations. 
We are still building linkages with mental health practitioners. We now may not be doing it in the general sense of hiring a mental health practitioner or professional, but we build the linkages through our programs, and that includes a very strong uh, employee and family assistance program. So that's our story, and I'd like to open it up for any questions. I know that leaves a lot of time, but... Um, that's okay, John. It's uh, it's actually timely. I think I didn't want to sh <laughs> cut off the presentation, but I was also noticing um, a lot of questions coming in. And first off, thank you so much for walking us through um, what seems ultimately was spearheaded by a vision, and patiently you started building the pieces together and quickly saw the, the enthusiasm. Um, and practically speaking, I think your presentation also provided a lot of great tips. Um, so much so that I think a lot of, th there's been actually a lot of questions coming in. And before we get started, I did want to mention um, a few participants asked questions around, you know, what other organizations out there may provide uh, training or assistance around peer support. Uh, certainly John has spoken about Tema Contra Memorial Trust, but there are other organizations. We encourage you to, um, you know, look online. There's a, a website in Ontario called firstrespondersfirst.ca, so you could take a look at that. Uh, but, you know, just acknowledge that there are different organizations in this space. So, John, um, a qu there's quite a few questions, so maybe I'll just start kind of in a chronological order. Um, so the first one that came from Melissa who asks how you would mitigate perpetuating secondary traumatic stress. In other words, how do you support the peer supporters? Um, what we ended up doing and what we found worked really well is the peer supporters were supporting each other. Some were in a busier area and they might provide uh, support to others, so you'd have that way of diffusing with a, another peer support team member. Um, the other key aspect is uh, I mentioned the wellness checks, and the goal of the wellness check is to have um, the people, all of members of the peer support team meet with a psychologist on a regular basis and do a wellness check. And it's just a, uh, to gauge how they're doing and to make sure that they're coping well and that their coping mechanisms are working still. Um, we have built very strong bonds within the team and it's, it's a whole peer system on their own. Um, mm -hmm. We're looking for anything we can do to make sure that the staff are kept sta safe. So. We don't have just one item that we use. Mm -hmm. we, we use multiple, if that helps. Yeah, no, it helps. And, and from what I hear, John, that there's more than one ways that you, you provide opportunities either to ask help or to check in or to do a wellness check um, and essentially ensuring that you're keeping those that are supporting others as healthy as, as best can be. Yes, um, can I, can, before you go yeah. on, can I just go back, Samuel, to that comment? When you are to uh, the comment about what other agencies are available to provide training, if you were to go online and you were to just type in peer support training, uh, you do come across a bunch of um, individual self-help or self-training packages that you read the package and then you're supposed to be able to train it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the idea is good. The information is pretty much good the same as what you would get in a formal training course, but you need to have that discussion. And, and our training was done in a manner that um, there were a lot of questions were coming up, and you need to have a better quality course. And there are other agencies other than Tema Contour. Um, check and see what's available. See just what is out there, and don't be afraid to call them because uh, it shouldn't be limited to the geographical area of who you want to talk to because there's so many ways, just like this webinar, of how to get your training done. Yeah, that's such a great point about the thoroughness and ensuring that you're not just picking something that's kind of already prepackaged, but really meeting the needs of your organization. Exactly. Um, I wonder, and um, some folks were curious to know because in organizations, typically we have our, you know, standard um, HR procedures and supports, including employee family assistance programs. Um, so ha have you, how did you kind of build or integrate the peer support teamwork uh, with existing EFAP programs? How did that look from your perspective? Um, it's, that's uh, excellent. Um, our uh, employee and family assistance program initially 
we didn't think it was working. We were of the typical mindset that we tr somebody may try it once and they said it didn't work and that pretty much polluted or, or tarnished our EFAP for the entire service. So with our wellness coordinator, remember I said earlier on that I had uh, a meeting with a lot of regional support staff and one of them being the well-being coordinator who looks after our EFAP um, uh, contract. Uh, they took this on very seriously and provided support and went after our provider and said, you've got to start stepping this up. And um, we did get a lot more responsive uh, behavior from our EFAP and in all honesty, we started to use what they call a trauma assist. And if you think about timelines, initially when we first started, um, if a member or a paramedic went off on a stress leave, operational stress leave, um, they would be sitting at home by themselves before the uh, presumptive legislature and all that came into effect. They'd be sitting at home by themselves for 8 to 12 weeks. The presumptive legislature sped that up a little bit, but it only sped it up to the point that WSIB could still be contacted, and it sped it up to about you know six to eight weeks. We weren't happy with that. We wanted something a lot more robust, something to get the help a lot quicker. Um, through our EAP and the trauma assist, uh, a staff member now, we have gotten it down to, we can have them having a face-to-face -face with a counselor within three days. And the better aspect of that actually, or one of the helpful aspects of that, is after an incident, if, a, if an employee is struggling, they can call the EFAP and be speaking to a counselor within 20 minutes, and that counselor can set up the appointment. And if you're with that employee when they're chatting with them, you can see the tension, the stress levels in that person just starting to drain from their body because they've got some hope. They know that they're now meeting with somebody. So there's, there's different theories on this, and some of it is uh, the old military term, three hots in a cot. And then there's some newer uh, thoughts on it that um, the three hots in a cot mean you should have three meals and a, and a good sleep before you uh, start looking for training, in, or I believe is how that one's worded. But then there's another theory that um, uh, you need to deal with the, some of these issues before you have that first sleep because sleep... Um, locks in the memories and it's those memories that you want to try and deal with so by seeing staff contact somebody and have that appointment set up the appointment may not be for three days but to have that done within 20 minutes that's where you start to see the stress and the relief because now they got the hope that's amazing uh, from some of the stories that i've you know and and experiences that have been shared with me um across the country often Organizations are struggling about how to enhance the EAP program, how to make it culturally appropriate. We hear sometimes, you know, of folks having to spend half an hour with their counselors just to explain to them what the job is. And it sounds like through your peer support program, you are actually able to advocate for better services from your existing EFAP program. Exactly. We're paying for yeah. it. We're paying for yeah, it. Yeah, you're paying for it. Let's make we, it good. One of, yeah. one of the key things also, um, if you don't know how your employee and family assistant program works, call it yourself. There's mm. absolutely nothing wrong with picking up the phone, dialing that 1-800 number or whatever the number is for your EFAP, and saying, I want to know what you can offer me. Speak to somebody. Find out what the process is to go through. We have found out that when we, after I've made that phone call a couple of times in that situation, just to find out... Um, uh, sorry, I'm uh, just to find out what is needed to be said said by the medic. So any time that I hear or I've coached all of our team to tell anybody that's calling the EFAP, if they say I'm a member of York Region Paramedic Services and I'd like to speak to trauma, someone about trauma assist, the response puts you in a different stream and you get seen and spoken to much quicker. So it's a mm -hmm. really important thing that you have to understand what are the key phrases to use make sure you understand uh, get a relationship going with whoever it is with your EFAP provider and make sure if we have a situation or a problem in New York I contact one person and that situation or problem is resolved 
before the end of that business day or before the end of the second business day. It's not sitting around. They have that responsibility and they get back to us. We've established the same type of relationship now with WSIB and, and, and the uh, workplace transition specialists that we use. You have to have that conversation. They don't just run the world. You've got to have some input. You've got to work with them. And by working with them, we've found that we're knocking down some huge barriers. Well done. Uh, honestly, it, it, some of the challenges that I continue hearing, it sounds like you've been able to, to really address them well. Um, switching gears a little bit, John, how, and, and perhaps this question comes from smaller services, how do you navigate um, the, the, the confidentiality aspect and, and building trust uh, amongst your colleagues for them to know that everything is kept confidential, but at the same time, um, respecting the real wor role that you're playing and being able to refer when needed? Um, our references go to the employee. We, we don't contact outside. Like we will say if, if there's a, ref uh, a referral needed, then we will provide that or we will help that employee get that referral. So it's not that we will be contacting somebody and saying, yeah, Billy Bob needs to be seen by you. Um, we'll give the information to Billy Bob and say, here's the number, would you like me to help call it? Um, so we're not really breaching any confidentiality that way. Um, I've made it very clear to all of our staff and myself personally as management, um, I really don't need to know any type of medical information. Uh, as far as return to work goes, I need to know restrictions and limitations. As far as any um, diagnosis goes, I don't need to know that. That's what's different with our peer support system is I don't need that information. I don't need to know what the mental health injury is. I need to know how you're doing. How are you coping? What can I do to help you? And I think that's where um, the confidentiality gets built. The trust is built. We also have a very strong agreement with our management that um, if we get a referral from anybody in our senior management or anybody saying, I'd like you to check on paramedic Smith, our response is okay, thank you. And then if they ever come back to us and say, did you check on paramedic Smith? Our response is yes. And that's it. We don't provide any other information. And, and some of the management does try to fish. Uh, some of my peers, my other supervisors, they try to fish for information. But we don't give it. We provide, did you speak to them? Yes, we did. That's it. So we try as hard as possible. A lot of times if peer support team members need some advice from me, they'll contact me and instead of uh, saying a color, our platoons are divided up into four different colors, uh, instead of saying a color, we'll uh, just say a, a peer um, and we'll use the pronouns like they, them, there. We won't use uh, he or she because that narrows it down in the service. So you try to be as general as possible. and, and what would you want shared about yourself? So people start thinking about things that way. And the confidentiality, it takes a while. It takes practice. But you can maintain confidentiality pretty good. It sounds like you're, you're finding some, through experience as well, some very nuanced and practical ways, including language. Um, I'm sure some folks wouldn't think about it, but using gender neutral pronouns helps kind of avoid this person rather than saying he or she or. Exactly. Um, Thanks for sharing that, John. I'm, I'm conscious of time. We're uh, at about eight minutes left before ending. There's still a few questions uh, coming in. Still good for you, John? Yeah, I'm good. Sure. Okay. So um, the next question uh, pertains to students um, in terms of how we can build resiliency training or peer support for students. And um, so if you can comment on that, and then also, I guess, if we take a look at the other side uh, for the um, older generations of workers. So you look at incoming students and the older generation of workers, and how do you bring everyone on board um, and then continue to build that culture where peer support is accepted and used? Um, that's a good question. Um, it, it's actually, I don't think it's overly separated by um, demographics like age because um, I mentioned earlier um, one of the our younger peer support team members 
came to me one day and they just weren't sure how to deal with the question that a senior medic came to them with about retirement. So I had mentioned that one and, and they, the younger medic, they're 30 years away from retirement so they weren't even thinking of that so they had to come and speak to me because I'm a little bit closer to retirement and see what was available, what could they offer and we provided the support that we needed and who to contact uh, through the region to help with some retirement planning. Um, with students and all that, what we found, what we've started doing when we get uh, new staff coming into our service is peer support presentation is part of their orientation program. Um, they're introduced and they actually get an opportunity to ride with peer support team members so we can give them a demonstration of what peer support is, not just telling them about it. Um, we, I have gone and spoken to uh, Centennial College last year, which was an excellent uh, opportunity to present to multiple students um, uh, throughout our area, throughout the GTA that were, were there from representing different colleges. And we talked about peer support. We planted the seed to give them the opportunity to let it grow. Um, because it really is individualized. It's looking at what is needed for your service, what you guys need. And a lot of the times uh, the peer support model that we're using is just to encourage discussion. So dealing with students, dealing with more senior, um, I have a very good friend in the service that continually, just like I had mentioned earlier in the presentation, they continually tell me they'll never use peer support. We've had some very good conversations while I've been helping them do up some paperwork or something like that. The peer support, like I said, doesn't have to have neon flashing lights. It, it's a very uh, underlying assistance. And then when it it is needed after a critical incident. There's that bond already built, so the conversation mm -hmm. occurs much more naturally, much more organically. It's not a forced conversation. It's, hey, how are you doing? And you get yeah. a much better buy-in that way. This takes me back to your example, John, uh, in the presentation where you highlighted in the peer support guidelines that the commission developed some years ago, we were very intentional in developing the idea that peer support starts from the very basic relationship, you know, two friends or two colleagues talking. That can be informal peer support. And to your point, as you start from the basics, then you build trust and then folks might feel more comfortable later on to access peer support, even if it's not labeled as such. Correct. I'd, I'd like to so give a final... Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Uh, do I have no, time? Quick, quick little example. We had yeah. a brand new employee that uh, started with our service um, and they were like two weeks into the job and their primary um, paternal figure in their life passed away suddenly and they were very upset by it but they had just started a new job, they didn't know what to do so um, they had heard about during the orientation, the peer support, um, they really weren't too familiar with who to contact so they contacted me. We had a little discussion, we were talking about stuff like that stuff what was going on and um, it was before the, the paternal figure passed away and then he passed away and they contacted me and said this is what's happened um, um, what do I do now and we had a good long chat and um, I said you're according to a collector agreement and all that stuff and for bereavement you're entitled to five days um, we can make arrangements out of that and they turned around and said no would it be okay if I stayed at work because I'm getting more support at work than I am at home. And that's what was key about peer support. There's a brand new person to our service, not aware of anybody, but they felt that trust, they felt that support, they wanted to be at work. Thanks for sharing that. It's a great reminder and sometimes there's a healthy amount of skepticism, let's say, when we're talking about mental health and mental illness. And in this case, you know, a reminder that we all yearn to be connected and to, to be supported by our colleagues and to continue living our identity, really, it's how we define ourselves through our work. Um, so on that note, I'm conscious that there's one minute left, and John, I can't thank you enough for uh, spending this time with us and sharing your experience and expertise and hopefully inspiring others to um, continue to look at ways to support their colleagues or maybe look at implementing a peer support program or something similar, uh, but really so appreciate your time, John, and I hope that uh, we can maybe do this again about another program or initiative that you're working on. And so um, with that, just a bit of housekeeping as we wrap things up. Um, our next webinar uh, will take place 
next month on Wednesday, May 30th, and usually they take place uh, at the same time at the end of every month. So more information will be posted on our website shortly. Uh, registrations usually uh, open a week or two before the webinar. And if you'd like to receive these invitations, please do uh, send us an email. We can add you to our list. Uh, the email address is webinar at mentalhealthcommission.ca. When you leave the room, um, you will either get a survey uh, pop-up or you'll get an email. Uh, but please take a minute just to tell us how we did. And if you have any suggestions, we saw a lot of great interest about potential speakers. Maybe we'll reach out to you directly, Glenn, because we think that a lot of people are curious about your program. And um, with that, I'd like to close today's webinar again to thank all of, uh, all of you for joining us. Thank you, John. Um, and, and really, we hope that you take care of yourselves. And if you need help or support, please reach out to a colleague um, and continue doing the great work that you do out there. Our hats off to the first responders across the country that do this work day in and day out. And we hope to see you again at our next webinar presentation. Bye for now.